Well, hi and welcome. My name is Casey Boland and I'm a wealth advisor with HCM Wealth Advisors. I'm joined today by Doug Johnson, who's our senior investment strategist, and Dan Rink, who's a research analyst with HCM Wealth Advisors. Welcome to our webinar. If you'd like to ask a question, please go to the bottom of your screen and click on Q&A, and there you'll have an opportunity to submit your question, and we'll do our best to answer at the end of our webinar. So, Doug, I always appreciate the music that you play. You do a great job with the selection. Probably shouldn't be up to me. The reason I say this, you know, a good plan gone bad. So I'm at the gym the other day, and I turn on the Hall & Oates station. And in the midst of my workout, uh, for whatever reason, then air supply comes on. That just doesn't work. So I, I say this in that the parallel of how about the Fed? Good plan gone bad. Did the Fed break anything? So those are going to be some things that we're going to talk about today. Uh, we're going to talk about the recent volatility we see in the banking sector. Has the Fed's rate high pack path changed? And what does this mean for the markets? All right, moving on. Let's take a look. Let's talk more in detail now about the, the bank failure here. So what's been in the, in the headlines recently? Well, it's been now for over two weeks, bank failures and a concern for several more regional banks. And, you know, what if I told you we just experienced the second and third largest bank failures in history? You know, what would your expectation for how the stock market would react? Well, volatility has picked up, but surprisingly, the stock market as a whole has been actually flat for the last couple of weeks during this last time period. Now, Different pockets of sectors, obviously the regional banks have really taken a hit. Some other sectors have done a little better, others a little worse. But on the whole, it's been interesting from an overall market perspective, you haven't seen a lot of movement. So these two banks, so Silicon Valley Bank, it was the second largest bank failure in history with assets of $175 billion. And do you remember number one? So number one was Washington Mutual that was back during the financial crisis in 2008. It had 188 billion in assets, and they were kind of a forced sale to J.P. Morgan Chase for just under two billion at that time. Number three, I mentioned Signature Bank here, which happened within a few days of the downfall of Silicon Valley Bank. So we've seen two ginormous failures within a two-week period of time, and we surprisingly when you look at the bottom of the key of this chart. You really hadn't had many banks that have failed since 2008. You had a major cluster there that Doug just highlighted from 08, 09, 10. But since 2018, there have been very few, a few banks, and they were been very small up until just a few weeks ago. So how big was the Silicon Valley Bank slide? So if we go to the next slide, as of the end of 2022, Silicon Valley Bank had more than $209 billion in assets ranking them number 16 in the country in size. And their assets have been quickly reduced to 175, 175 billion. And I think even substantially less when they were taken over by FDIC. So why did Silicon Valley Bank fail? So moving on to the next slide, uh, uh, some of these bullet points, hopefully you can see it on your screen. Uh, I printed it out because it's a little bit difficult to see some of these bullet points. So I'm going to read them. We're going to go through these different steps of this process of what happened. So in step number one, so a little bit about Silicon Valley Bank. It's a bank that focuses heavily on U.S. technology startups. It's estimated that they work with 50% of all technology startups in the country. Uh, number two, during the COVID-19 pandemic, the bank saw a surge in deposits as tech companies profited from providing entertainment and delivery services to people confined, confined to their homes. So you had this huge venture capital boom bust cycle that followed the decade of already outsized gains. And you saw assets at Silicon Valley Bank jump from almost 62 billion in January of 2020 to over 189 billion by the end of 2021. And all this cash needed a home, which gets us to point number three. So Silicon Valley Bank invested much of this cash in U.S. government bonds, which are traditionally considered a safe investment. So a, a point of clarity here, these were not risky bonds. These are money good bonds, meaning if held to maturity, you get 100 cents on the dollar. So let's move on to the next step, which is step five here, the tech boom. So as economic conditions for the tech sector became more difficult, 
many of SVB's customers began to draw on their funds to stay afloat. So the tech boom started to turn. More and more customers were starting to need their cash, which is starting to put some strain on the bank on the deposits that they held. So step six, short on cash, SVB was forced to sell its bonds at big losses, leading to concerns about the bank's financial health. So we said before these bonds were safe if held to maturity. There's a relationship with bonds that it looks like a teeter-totter on the playground. When interest rates rise, bonds lose value. Well, how does that happen? Well, imagine the bank purchased 10-year treasury bonds. A 10-year treasury bond had an interest rate in the range of 1.78% on the high end to 0.54% on the low end during that time period of January 2020 to December of 2021. So these banks were buying bonds anywhere that were issuing barely above a half percent to maybe around one and a half percent, when three quarters percent. And the 10-year treasury currently is at 3.43 percent and has been as high as 4.23 percent in the last year. So you can see with the Federal Reserve moving interest rates very quickly, interest rates have surged. And with that teeter-totter effect with rates going up, that really had an impact on the value of bonds. So that's a substantial move. And if you're a seller and you have to sell bonds, then you experience losses in that time period. So moving on to step seven here. Within 48 hours, depositors withdrew enough funds to cause the bank's collapse. Experts suggest that SVB's collapse was due to a lack of diversification in its assets and a risky interest rate management strategy. You know, many venture capital firms put the word out to withdraw their assets from Silicon Valley Bank, which resulted in a bank run. The FDIC stepped in to take over the bank. Uh, ultimately, depositors were made whole on all their deposits in the bank. But lastly, last step here, um, you know, they also highlight the importance of step eight for banks to have more diversified loans in order to weather economic downturns. Silicon Valley was more of a niche type, niche type of bank. It was to their detriment in the end. They didn't have enough diversification to make up their clients, the types of loans, the assets. Um, so I think that a question I think this begs is, you know, is it here we go again? Is this, or are we headed for another 07, 08, 09? I think it's a natural question that had been coming up on some people's minds. And while I can't guarantee you nothing untoward will occur, I can tell you this is not the subprime securitized mortgage debacle that metastasized in the 07, 09 great financial crisis. And there are surely parallels between then and now, but from what we've learned so far, the differences seem far more significant than the similarities. All right, moving on. So let's take a look at, from a bank failure standpoint, this slide highlights where banks stand in regard to uh, two different points. One is deposits greater than $250,000, meaning the percentage of assets without FDIC coverage. So that's the vertical axis, and Doug was pointing to that on the left. And then unrealized losses as a percentage of what's called CET1 capital. So CET1 stands for Common Equity Tier 1 Capital. It's a measure of a bank's financial strength and its ability to absorb unexpected losses. And this is the horizontal access. So you can see Silicon Valley Bank was an outlier as it had high unrealized losses and a high percentage of uninsured depositors. And we just talked about how the Silicon Valley ran, Bank ran into some issues with their bonds. So they were in a very difficult position. And then Signature Bank, which is SBNY on the chart, they had a substantial amount of assets that were uninsured, which made it more susceptible to a bank run. And the majority of the banks, though, when you take a look at them, at least from a positive standpoint, they seem to be more clustered. You don't have those outliers like those two banks. All right, moving on to the next slide, uh, bank lending. Uh, so just to step back for a moment, why did the government step in and back the depositors of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. I'm not saying whether this is um, the right thing to do to step in. It's a very, very delicate question. 
uh, that people feel strongly about in some cases of backing it or you don't back up banks, period. You just don't do that. You don't go down that avenue. So let's just talk about the ripple effects that could have come beyond the loans associated, the losses associated with the assets with those two banks. So there would have been an, a, a lot of ripple effects just with those two banks alone, just with the, the customers there. But we've started to see those regional banks, they've come under pressure immediately after the failure of these two banks. And regional banks are critically important to the economy. So looking at this chart, you can see that about 50% of all commercial loans and in industrial lending occurs with small banks, banks meaning smaller than $250, $250 billion in assets. Now, it's not pictured here, but a few other stats, small and medium banks, they account for 60% of total residential lending and 80% of total commercial real estate lending. So they're a critical component of the economy. And without the backing, it would be conceivable for people to take their assets and just go directly to the four biggest banks if there was this perceived risk. This means less banks, less competition, ultimately higher fees would come from the biggest banks. Uh, so moving on. All right, let's take a let's look at cash at the banks right now. Cash levels at banks, uh, you saw this with SVB. Banks cash have surged during the pandemic. Um, the positive here, though, is you've got a lot of excess cash holdings, which bodes well should we run into issues with the economy in the coming quarters. So you've got consumers and businesses that are a little bit, a little heavier in cash right now, which is a good thing. All right, Doug, back to some of my questions earlier here. So uh, we've got a picture of Jerome Powell, two red buttons, high inflation. Bank failures. How, how does uh, how does Jerome Powell take care of these issues here? Well, he's he certainly put himself uh, in a in a tough spot, and I think based on yesterday, he probably he probably didn't push either one of these. Um, if there was a button in the middle that just had a big question mark on it, I think that's probably the one uh, that would have uh, been pushed here. But I think the point of this is that going into yesterday's Fed decision. Had they chose the path of high inflation, they would have said, you know what, the you know, the stress in the financial system right now is too great. We need to do something in order to shore that up. So we are going to stop raising rates and pause. Um, on the flip side, if they would have continued to be aggressive with the rate hike campaign, which we're going to see how the pricing is adjusted uh, just over the past two weeks, um, it could have definitely set the stage for additional bank failure. So again, you know, a, a problem probably of their own doing over an extremely long period of time, um, but definitely a choice now um, that is going to put that mantra of higher for longer uh, to the test. So we mentioned what will the Fed do on March 22nd? Now, I also understand today is March 23rd. So this is the decision from yesterday, but this illustrates the volatility that we've seen in the Fed futures pricing um, since the Silicon Valley bank collapse happened. So going back as early as, we'll say, February 2nd of this year, you had basically a consistent 100% chance that the Fed was going to raise 25 basis points, which they ultimately did. But then once the bank ran into problems, you see the odds for this collapse. Um, over the course of five days, we went from 100% down to 55, back up to 80% the following day when the Fed and the Treasury basically came in and said, hey, we're going to backstop the deposits. We are also going to open up an additional lending facility for banks to um, use the Treasuries and mortgage-backed securities on their balance sheet. And we're going to treat those as if they're trading at par value. Um, so the collateral amounts will be higher. Therefore, they can get more uh, money lent to them uh, for the Federal Reserve to kind of shore up their balance sheet. So it hops up to 80%. And then immediately, as you start to see pressure in some of the financial um, institutions and, and regional bank stock prices, this comes down back to 72. So uh, an awful lot of volatility in this. And then you can see the kind of subsequent spike here, uh, the probability of no rate hike. So we were talking about 50 basis points possibly two weeks ago, and now all of a sudden it's 25 or zero. So you can see the ripple effect 
that this caused immediately in the Fed funds futures market um, and really kind of posed the question, what is the Fed going to do now going forward? So this was based on yesterday, and this is this is an interesting chart. So let me read the dialogue first. So less than two weeks ago, on March 8th, markets were edging towards a near 6% terminal rate. So the terminal rate is just basically the, the highest rate that the Fed's going to go to on the Fed funds until they pause, um, and a low point of 4.1 in 2025. So just a week after that, they were pricing in around a half a percent to 0.75% of cuts by year end and a low point of 2.65% in 2025. And you can see here, as this line goes down, this is the number of hikes above this zero line and then cuts below it. So you've got all these cuts priced in. And what's unique about this is that yesterday, Powell was very explicit in his word saying, they do not expect to see any rate cuts this year. And the market is basically saying, we don't believe you. You're lying to us. We're going to force you to cut rates. So there's still very much this tug of war going on between what the market is seeing and pricing in and what the Fed is trying to convey um, in terms of their rate path. And this kind of projection of rate cuts has only intensified uh, since the start of this you know, financial issue. Now, the other problem that the Fed is still dealing with uh, is the inflation issue. We've seen peak inflation back in um, you know, kind of late, middle last year, and we're hoping that it's going to be uh, the peak of the cycle, um, well above 8% here. But you can see that the contribution to inflation have changed uh, quite substantially. So when all of this started, you had energy, food, um, goods, X food and energy, um, you know, doing a lot to, to, to raise this number where you had services that were you know, still a part of it, but not as extreme. So now you've got energy, which has come down quite a bit. You've had goods come down quite a bit. You still have some food inflation, but now services is, is making up a good majority of this. And the concern is that the services, which is basically wage inflation, is ultimately the stickiest. Uh, it's the hardest to get rid of. So the Fed ultimately wants this number and this bar to be back down on this line. Um, but right now, the, in the, the wage inflation alone uh, is continuing to grow and is up around 4%. So they still have their work cut out for them in terms of trying to get that number lower, but they cannot be as aggressive as they might have wanted to be now that they have these issues going on uh, in the financial sector. So you know, we looked at some Fed funds futures. Now, this is basically the two-year yield going back to 2006. So we've seen an incredible amount of volatility. Uh, in the two-year yield. Um, you can see back you know, in, in, in 06, 07, 08, before the great financial crisis, two-year yield was about four and a half, five percent Subsequently, right about where we were before all this stuff uh, kind of started to, uh, to snowball a little bit. You see a big drop during the financial crisis as they cut rates. Then during the entire QE era, we had low two-year rates. They made an effort to raise rates back in 2018. Market said, no, we don't like this. All of a sudden, they turned around, cut rates back down, COVID hits, and then basically you have a two-year yield on the floor until the latest rate hike cycle all the way back up here. And then you had it drop about 130 basis points uh, over the course of, of five days. That's a, that's a massive move. Uh, to give you an idea how big a move that is, um, <laughs> Not necessarily an intentional plan words there, but the move index is what it's called. This registers the volatility in the bond market, basically the, the fluctuation rates. And the arrows here point to other times of stress in this index. Not surprisingly, you have the great financial crisis here, and then you have COVID here. But even in the time period that we just saw over the past two weeks, you had more volatility in the rate market on the short end, which is historically very, very safe money. Um, and it doesn't see a lot of volatility, moving more than you did during COVID and more than you did during the great financial crisis. So it's, it's been eye-opening to see those moves. We're seeing you know, 40, 50 basis point moves uh, in a single day for the two-year treasury. So uh, really, really some extreme stuff going on right now in the, in the bond market, at least in the treasury market. Now, the title of this slide is, you know, not everyone is worried. So usually when you see big market panics or financial crisis that 
uh, kind of metastasize out, you see issues in the credit markets and particularly um, credit markets that may be higher risk. So you've got junk bonds here, which is represented by J and K, which is the um, is one of the high yield ETFs. You have investment grade bonds uh, represented by LQD, which is the biggest uh, investment grade corporate ETF. And you have senior loans uh, represented by BKLN, which also are known as bank loans or floating rate loans. So kind of a safer version of high yield, we'll call it, um, higher in the capital stack, um, but still very much capital at risk. So if you look and compare the three-day price changes to periods of what we call panic in the past, namely COVID, great, great financial crisis, you're not seeing volatility in the price movements of these assets anywhere near as what we saw during those timeframes. So the credit market, at least right now, is saying, hey, you know what? We're, we're not really worried about this turning into something bigger. Doesn't mean it can't, but if, if you're, you know, if you're kind of sitting back and you're saying, oh my gosh, this is going to be the next financial crisis, you can't have the next financial crisis with, you know, uh, price movements being this calm in these markets. Again, it doesn't mean that it can't happen, but as of now, if we're looking for signs of optimism around what's going on, I think these three charts uh, go a long way to maybe paint uh, a picture of things not as dire uh, as some of the uh, headlines might uh, might lead you to believe. And then if you want to kind of relate that to equities, you have the VIX index here. Again, panic spike, panic spike. We haven't really seen any movement uh, in the VIX so far. So that is a, um, a good sign uh, throughout all this. Now, here's another um, picture that we dug up. And it's, uh, uh, I, I want to say this is actually... Um, from the movie Rocky II, um, where Sylvester Stallone and um, Apollo Creed, I can't, I can't think of the actor's name right now, are running on the beach uh, in, in kind of a comical training scene. Uh, and then at the end, they, you know, they become friends and, have, or, or, you know, uh, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. But this shows that, you know, you have this combination of banks failing, which, Again, that's, I think, you know, we've had two banks fail, but to, to say that this is going to go on and on, I think is a little bit dramatic, but we'll use it for now. And then you have the Fed tightening monetary policy. So these two things together can actually create the kind of growth slowing tight financial conditions that ultimately the Fed is looking for to try to slow the economy down and eventually bring inflation down to a level um, that in their eyes is... is um, is acceptable. Now, here's another way to look at kind of the non-Fed tightening. Um, so these bank stresses have act to tighten uh, like the big rate hikes last year. So you can see how this, um, when when this line is above uh, the zero level here, uh, this is the U.S. financial conditions gauge. So up here, financial conditions are loose. Down here, they are tighter. So when banks look at the situation now, they may say, you know what, we need to make sure that our capital base is as sound as we can get it. If that means they are going to possibly raise um, the credit scores, uh, their requirements on what they're going to lend to, uh, they may do that. But that lending might slow down a little bit um, and ultimately kind of slow the flow of money through the economy uh, and, and act as as a set of breaks um, you know, towards economic activity. Now, the Fed was trying to do this on their own through rate hikes. I think if you put a gun to their head, they probably would say, you know what, we could do without the bank failures and we can still try to go at this on our own. But if there is anything that is positive that possibly comes out of this, uh, I think it could be uh, this kind of dual tightening um, that is not 100% on the Fed. Now, we talked about you know, what are higher rates going to do? Uh, it's kind of lagged effect, so to speak, uh, of higher rates in the economy. So this is the annual growth rate of the uh, leading economic indicators. And we can see that this continued to decline in February, um, along with the year over year change uh, in real GDP. So historically, when you see the leading economic indicators move lower like that, uh, there's a good probability that recession um, is somewhat close. Now, there's no hard and fast rule to where this needs to go to. But if you looked at this and said, okay, based on this alone, is this recessionary? Uh, you know, possibly. Um, and we talked a lot about how there's 
what I would say, you know, mixed signals in the economy, so to speak, um, between recession and non-recession with labor being a positive, um, this is certainly one that I think would fall on the negative side of the ledger. And then finally, um, we haven't looked at the, uh, the Fed's balance sheet recently, um, but this little circle here, this looks like QE. Um, and what is QE again? So QE stands for quantitative easing, um, basically a process where the Fed adds bonds to their balance sheet, buys them from larger banks uh, to basically give money to the banks and the banks either keep that money on their balance sheet or they're encouraged to lend that out. So it's just a, it's an increase in liquidity into the system. And you can see a large part of QE that we saw post COVID was you know, a vertical spike where they just basically went and said, you know what, we're going to buy all this stuff. We're buying corporate bonds, junk bonds, corporate bond or uh, treasury bonds, um, a huge expansion of the balance sheet, which peaked coincidentally right around the time that we saw the top of the market. And then one of the goals of the Fed's tightening policy has been to look to roll that balance sheet down a little bit, sell those assets off and kind of uh, tighten policy, so to speak. But now all of a sudden with this banking crisis, you see this massive spike up, I think about $300 billion over the course of a week. Um, so if this is the start of a, a new QE cycle, which we're not saying it is, but this kind of looks like QE in a time frame of tightening, you know, how, how is that going to play out for markets? Uh, and I think, um, you know, that is a very interesting question as we move into this year. And Dan, you've been sitting there uh, patiently. So <laughs> I'll pose the question to you, um, you know, as we go into these, this unknown of, is this going to be continuation of quantitative tightening or beginning of quantitative easing or both? You know, how has that not only affected returns so far this year, but maybe in past instances uh, of the extremes of each of these situations? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we have a lot of good data over the last two years with, you know, quantitative tightening, tightening cycles and quantitative easing cycles. So we'll definitely touch on those. Um, so right now we're going to look at um, 2023 uh, returns so far with bonds and equities. Uh, starting with bonds here. So as you can see, it's been a pretty volatile year for bonds, even though they are positive. Um, you know, late in 2022 and early 2023, um, all the talk was about the Fed finally ending their hike, their rate hiking cycle. And you saw bonds start to hit a little bit of a rally because they started seeing the end of this tightening through rising interest rates. And that's what you saw at the start of January um, heading up where Doug is pointing out right there. And it, it was a pretty broad rally in fixed income. So you had muni bonds, US aggregate bonds, um, high yield bonds and investment grade corporate bonds all rallying to start the year. Then around February, you had the Fed come in and come out and say, you know what, we're still not seeing as much progress on inflation as we would like at this point in our tightening cycle. And you start to you started to see rates rise because the higher for longer narrative became um, a little bit more weighed a little bit more on on interest rates and bonds. Um, so you kind of saw February to March, you saw interest rates rising, bonds falling again across the board. And then with um, SVB and Signature Bank uh, causing a little bit of pressure in the markets, um, you saw people kind of run to the safe haven of bonds, which gave them a bid. Um, and you saw uh, corporate bonds, you saw the U.S. aggregate bond index, you saw um, the muni bond at index start to rally pretty well. Um, so as, as you can see, it's, it's nice to see a positive number next to bonds, which is a very different story than last year, um, but it definitely has been a pretty volatile start. Um, and one thing to notice on this chart is that almost horizontal blue line. That's the Schwab value advantage money market, which we have a pretty uh, good chunk of our bond portfolios in right now. Um, as you can see, it's holding completely stable. Um, and right now it's paying about four and a half percent interest. Uh, 
So it, it's very difficult looking at all this bond volatility and seeing um, how the bond market has been reacting to Fed comments day in and day out, uh, seeing all the volatility. It's hard to say, I'm going to give up this 4.5% to take a risk, risk in bonds at this point. Um, at some point, we'll definitely be going in to buy fixed income, to buy longer duration bonds. But it, it's very difficult to not take that 4.5% with essentially no risk. Um, so, and on the equity side, so a little bit of a different story than 2022. Um, really, you've seen at the start of the year, the Fed coming out saying, you know, we're going to slow down the hiking. Um, you saw growth indexes, specifically um, the Vanguard mega cap growth indexes, really start to take off. So that's that magenta line that Doug's pointing out right there, up 13.29% year to date. Um, and then you have a couple of uh, indexes bunched up there. That's the S&P 500 up 2.37. You have MSCI Acqui, which is international at 1.04. And then you have the Russell 2000, which is small caps, down 1.8. Now, what we have is two ETFs at the bottom, which outperformed very well for us in 2022, which are starting to lag a little bit. So you have the um, iShares Core High Dividend ETF, which is HDV, and then you have the Schwab US Dividend ETF, which is SCHD. So you're starting to see a little bit of regime shift. That's where we kind of have to ask the question, are we tightening or are we easing? Um, so we're going to look back a little bit into the last cycles. So <clears throat> after COVID, we had what we like to call the max QE era. So that was from the COVID lows all the way up to the end of 2021, where, as Doug showed on that chart previously, the Fed was injecting a lot of liquidity and keeping interest rates very low. So in this environment, there's a pretty much um, unanimous standout, and that's the Vanguard mega cap growth. So you saw a lot of growth names um, really capitalizing on this high liquidity to grow their companies as fast as possible. And then towards the bottom, you had HDV, which is the iShares High Dividend Yield, and you had International. Now, International lagged because the dollar really, really rallied um, in this post-QE or this post-COVID QE era. So it really uh, kind of dragged International there. Now, conversely, um, the, the max QT area, the max, max quantitative tightening era, era, which was the end of 2021 and all of 2022, you saw a little bit of a different story. So the Fed was taking liquidity out of the market. They were raising interest rates. And that's where you saw at the very top there, uh, HDV, which is our more defensive value name outperforming. You saw SCHD, um, which is the Schwab US Dividend ETF, which buys dividend growing companies that performed significantly better than the S&P 500. Um, and then you saw at the very bottom that Vanguard mega cap growth. So in times where there's tightening, you're going to see the more defensive names uh, outperform. In times of easing, uh, you're going to see those mega cap growth names outperform. Now, if we take a look at the whole cycle, um, there's really one clear winner and one clear loser. So that magenta line that up 87.96 from the COVID bottom is SCHD. So that's that Schwab US dividend um, ETF. You know, they buy high quality companies that are going in and trying to grow their dividend every single year and they screen companies for high quality. And that's performed through both of those cycles, both the quantitative tapering and the quantitative easing, it's performed the best and significantly so. And then at the very bottom, uh, again, you have international, um, which really took a beating because of the rising dollar um, in the 2020, 2021, 2022 era. So we can go on to the next slide there. So post COVID cycle, we're gonna take a look a little bit at um, the whole entire cycle for fixed income. Right. So this, again, shows the uh, in blue there, the high yield, the high yield bonds um, in, in purple there. That's the muni bonds. 
then in green is investment grade corporate bonds. And then at the very bottom, you have the US aggregate bond index. So as you can see, in the post QE era, things were pretty stable. Um, high yield caught a pretty significant bid because liquidity was rolling into the market. But once you started getting to January 2022 and through July 2022, that's when the Fed really came out and started tightening pretty significantly. And you saw fixed income pretty much across the board take a hit. And that was the Fed taking liquidity out of the system, raising rates, interest rates were skyrocketing, and it was putting a lot of pressure on bonds. And then we want to talk a little bit about um, two biases that we've been, or one bias that we've been seeing uh, quite often, especially in financial media and investors across the board, um, and it's the anchoring and adjustment bias. So if you pull up, you know, CNBC or you talk or you read investment research reports, you'll see people saying, oh, this is the next great financial crisis. Or they'll be saying, oh, this is just a dip like the COVID lows and you should be buying this aggressively because this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Um, and we really want to make sure that we take a step back and try not to pigeonhole this market into one of those two instances. Um, because ever since the great financial crisis all the way up through now, that's 192 months. And those periods are only 28 months out of that. So that's only 15% of the time. So, you know, while we're looking at the great financial crisis, we're looking at COVID, we're looking at all sorts of market cycles and trying to learn as much as we can from them. We have to realize and adjust with current market data because the market will always act a little bit differently every time. And we want to make sure that we are reacting to the most um, relevant and recent data instead of going back and saying, oh, we have SVB failing. This is the next great financial crisis. So we want to make sure that we're taking kind of our behavioral biases out of our investment process when we're going in and not saying, hey, we should go all cash or, hey, we should be buying equities hand over fist because we can only really uh, rely on the data that we're given. So we want to make sure that um, we're not having those voices in the back of our heads saying this is 0809. And then uh, I just want to touch a little bit on kind of the technical analysis of the S&P 500. Um, so this is a chart throughout this whole entire uh, bear market cycle that we've been in. Um, and as you can see, I've shown this a few times, that downward black trend line. Um, you know, we, we've went and the market has tested those prices many, many times over the last um, 12 to 18 months. But recently, um, earlier this year, we actually broke out of um, that downtrend. Now, whenever you have breakouts of very significant downtrends that have been in place for a very long time, typically the market will test that downtrend to make sure that this isn't a false breakout. So as you can see, we broke out above that trend line and then the market fell to touch that trend line again and we bounced right off of it. And essentially that's supply and demand. You have a lot of institutional investors sitting there um, placing buys right on that trend line um, to see if it will hold. Now, over the next couple of weeks, if this market um, continues to move in an upward trajectory, we can say that this was a, this is a successful breakout and the downtrend is no longer intact. <clears throat> now, if the market continues to collapse or not continues to collapse, but um, falls down back into that trend line, we would label this a failed breakout and we would say this downtrend is still intact. But we are right around the moving averages. You have the 100-day crossing, the 200-day moving average. You already had the 50-day cross, the 200-day moving average, which is the, the golden cross, quote unquote. Um, so right now, we're definitely looking to see if this breakout can hold. Um, but right now, you have the moving averages. You have the, the retest of the trend. Um, everything is looking um, like we could be breaking out of this downtrend uh, finally after about 18 months. Doug, you're muted. Sorry, I was, on, I was on mute there for a minute. Um, thanks, Dan, for that update. So, so where are we in terms of the, the, HM, uh, the HCM case? So um, I think the higher for longer message from the Fed um, will be put to the test on the heels of, of what we've seen in increased volatility in the financial sector. Um, I think they're really going to have um, their work cut out for them 
kind of relaying a message of all is well, um, but then also acting with a heavy hand if inflation stays elevated and saying, okay, we need to continue to, to move rates higher. Um, I think the 25 basis point hike uh, yesterday was probably uh, uh, you know, the most prudent decision. Um, you did have some volatility when you had uh, Janet Yellen come out and mention that they weren't considering uh, a plan for uh, deposit insurance uh, or covering all of the deposit uh, in the banking system with the market did not like that. Um, sure enough, she came out today just about an hour before uh, we came on and, and changed her tune a little bit. So that's kind of an, an ongoing thing. And, you know, just, just a point of simple math, there's about $18 trillion in U.S. bank deposits and about $125 billion in actual FDIC insurance money. So you do the math there, there's about a 1% coverage rate. So if the worst scenario came true, where everybody decided to go to their banks and pull out their money, um, the FDIC simply doesn't have the money to cover it. And I don't think the system was ever designed that way. So for them to put in explicit guarantees on deposits would require legislation. Um, it would require some other things. So I don't think they're going to come out and say, yes, we're going to do this. But I think on the heels of what happened uh, with SVB, they would have a hard time, uh, I think, presenting a case to not do it going forward. I know they've used the language around, you know, if we feel like the bank is um, a threat to the financial system, but I think at this point, you know, most, most banks uh, are so intertwined that there's going to be some risk um, at that point. So, you know, based on, based on the higher for longer, um, and then based on now what we're seeing, um, we've reduced our value over it a little bit as markets have begun to price in lower rates by the end of the year. So Dan kind of went through the scenarios of max QE, which was you know, really the time period when rates were moving lower. Um, and that has been a boon uh, to growth assets. On the flip side of that, if, if we feel like the economy is going to slow based on all these headwinds, then things like cyclical value are probably not going to be the best place to be. Um, so we've also looked to kind of reduce that as well and, and really balance out our exposures uh, a little bit better. So the data on recession, I think, remains mixed uh, going into the heart of earnings season. Um, employment you know, remains strong uh, despite softening of some economic data. We saw the leading economic indicator numbers earlier. Um, and ultimately, that has led us to maintain a neutral exposure uh, to stocks uh, at this time. Um, we're maintaining high levels of cash. Uh, yields continue to remain attractive. And as long as the Fed is raising interest rates, they're going to continue to creep higher. So we see that as a viable option uh, in terms of allocating money in the fixed income space. Um, but we also don't want clients to lose sight of core bonds and the production that they can provide against recession and or fi financial turmoil, which we've seen front and center uh, over the past two weeks where you know, I think you had 10-year rates that were around the 3837 range um, now trading in the in the 3334 range. And again, as rates move down, bond prices go up, and that provides some insulation uh, against what we would see um, on the equity side if, if we saw downward pressure there. Now, that didn't work out quite the, the way that it normally would last year, but we're seeing that relationship um, kind of get more in line, so to speak. And then finally, um, you know, we've kind of had a timeline internally with for an economic slowdown in the back half of 2023. Uh, I'd say that timeline remains, but I think tighter lending standards going forward um, could accelerate that timeline a little bit. Um, and as we stated before, the effect on asset prices is going to depend whether or not the slowdown remains shallow or turns into a recession. Um, you've got a lot of kind of bad news priced into the macro environment right now. So I think if the economy can find a way to remain resilient and navigate through this with inflation coming down and the Fed kind of slowing down a little bit, it, it could provide the setup um, for, for equity prices at worst to find some support um, and best case scenario to maybe, to maybe move a little bit higher. Um, you know, and, and to piggyback on what Dan said earlier, uh, about the extremes, you know, we we don't we don't need to be in a market that's like 08 anytime we have volatility, 
And we don't need to be in a market that was like 2021 anytime there's upward pressure. Um, we can be in markets that move sideways um, and that have a little bit of uh, uncertainty in them. And that's, again, where I think the income component of portfolios can make a lot of sense for investors to generate return when the price um, when the, the price return may not be there um, like we would historically expect it to be. So I think that is all our prepared remarks right now. Um, I'm trying to look through the uh, question uh, queue right now. I know we've had a lot of questions, not, not only today, but as this has taken place about what we think about regional banks, the financial sector, maybe some assets related to this. Um, I will um, kind of give the same answer that I have been. Um, we put out a short video, um, I think it was last week, that really highlighted specifically the, the concerns of the financial sector. But I think if you are looking on a long timeline and you're not looking to add um, a ton of capital to the position, um, I think there could be some opportunities popping up in the financial sector, but I would not go in aggressively right now. I think there's still a lot of uncertainty going on. Um, and until you see some of that settle out a little bit, um, we could see another leg lower here. Um, but if you were looking to establish a position and you were willing to, you know, live with it for, you know, three to five years, um, I think, you know, taking an initial step here uh, is not the worst thing in the world. Um, I would look for higher quality as opposed to trying to get a quick trade um, with the mindset that a bailout for a company or a buyout rescue doesn't necessarily help the equity holders. Uh, we saw that um, with the Credit Suisse deal. Uh, Credit Suisse was trading um, on a U.S. dollar basis in the uh, mid to low twos, yep. and then UBS came in and said, "Hey, we'll." bail you out, we'll buy you, whatever you want to call it. Next thing you know, Credit Suisse's price is 89, 90 cents, um, you know, based on the deal. So I think you do have to realize that that's a very real possibility when you're dealing with the equity portion uh, of some of these banks. But if you do your homework, and I think you're, you're, you're somewhat um, mindful of how you do it, uh, there could be some opportunities popping up uh, in some of those sectors. Uh, Casey, Dan, anything to add on that? On that topic, uh, no. I mean, I think you, uh, I think you hit that on the nail. And uh, I mean, prior to the whole Credit Suisse situation, I think the stock was already down ninety percent from mm -hmm. from its high anyway. So you know, it it it, it appeared, I think, for some maybe that it was a, uh, a a viable stock potentially to dip in. But again, as you found, as you could quickly find out, it doesn't mean that it can't get cut a whole lot more. Uh, as far as the value of it. So uh, separately, there was a question regarding kind of energy sector uh, with some some uh, prices being depressed right now. So Doug, uh, any thoughts on energy stocks at the at these levels? Yeah, so energy is interesting. Um, I think that um, what you're seeing right now is a little pressure, probably more recession worries um, than actual supply de demand dynamics. Um, you know, one of the, I guess, beliefs um, for the you know, tailwind of energy was things like the reopening of China, um, the reduction over time of CapEx that we've seen from oil companies, um, you know, the, the supply that's come offline due to the Ukraine conflict. Um, and that was going to, you know, at best, drive oil prices extremely high and at worst kind of put a floor uh, on those. Now, you know, as I said, if the economy starts to slow down or you get recession, usually energy prices go go down with it. Um, that's just an offshoot of a recession. Um, but what I would say is that you know, energy companies are still probably in pretty good shape generating cash flow. Um, they don't, you know, the, the the bigger established companies they don't need a hundred dollar oil uh, to make a lot of money. Uh, those are more of your your deep deep well drillers. You know, platforms out of the ocean that are very sensitive to the price of oil. You know, they may need $80, $70 oil uh, as their break even targets. But I think more some of the more of the established companies, um, the more diversified players, probably don't need that. And I would say they're still good candidates for things like dividend increases, stock buybacks. Um, but the, 
the, the quote unquote big price movements that we saw over the last year, I think that's probably come and gone. Uh, it doesn't mean the price can't go a little bit higher, but I think now it's, it's become more of a total return story. So there was a question related to um, some different commodity stocks and, and uh, so, so Doug, you can help me with this, but I, I, I'm venture to say that with being more of a cyclical play that unless we get a real rebound in the economy at this stage, the, the upside might be a little bit more limited at this point in time, unless, you know, things may, if things turned around the economy and we were near the lows and certainly they could be positioned well, but I think until things stabilize, uh, those have the potential to be volatile one way or the other on both sides. So it, it just might be a little bit early at the, at least at this stage, if just given the outlook right now for the economy. Yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, you know, when you're talking about commodity companies, I think it's important to understand what the what the company's relationship is to the actual commodity that they're that they're in, involved in. Um, so I think one thing that people forget is commodities are extremely volatile. Um, when they're going up, they're going gangbusters. When they're going down, they're going down fast. So you know, doing something like a direct exposure to commodities um, can be kind of a very volatile way. To gain exposure for that, um, but if you're, you know, if you're talking about companies that maybe have indirect exposure, um, you know, depending on the quality structure and how leveraged they are to the actual commodity as an input, um, yeah, I, th I think some of those can can still make sense. Um, yes, they're going to have some cyclicality to them um, if you run into a recession, but um, you know, commodities are always going to be, um, you know, part of life in, in, in the sense that. We have to use most of this stuff day in and day out. So, um, you know, I wouldn't shun them completely, but um, if we do get into a growth slowdown, I would expect those to come under some pressure. So there's a question about treasuries. I think treasuries are still attractive. You may actually look at CDs um, just because, as, as Doug and Dan mentioned earlier, the volatility that's occurred in the interest rate market, some of these short-term rates have moved a substantial amount and in fact, some of the CD rates uh, that are out there through some of the brokerage firms we can access are, are pretty attractive and a little bit higher right now than treasuries. And on the uh, a question related to kind of more big tech, um, and, and do those seem to be attractive? And, and I think from what you guys mentioned with growth being a little bit more attractive as of late, you know, the, 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 the positive with big tech is you, there are several companies that have substantial substantial growth rates and can grow their earnings regardless of the economic environment. And if they can achieve it different ways, they can have top line growth, but if top line growth isn't there, unfortunately, you're seeing some things in the headlines. I'm not saying that these are good things, but when you start cutting costs, you can add to the bottom line as well. So these companies have the ability to produce substantial earnings to the bottom line, and they've got different levers to do it. Yeah, I mean, the cash. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They, have, they have tons of cash. I mean, the valuations aren't uh, extremely attractive like they were before. But Casey, as you mentioned, um, you know, an economic reality, I think that some of these companies are finding out are they're, they're bloated in terms of their workforce. So they can probably cut a lot of jobs, not lose any productivity, and all of that drops to their bottom line. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think the combination of all of those things right now um, are, are maybe why those, those mega cap tech names are, are, are catching a bid uh, in an environment where, you know, you're looking for safety, so to speak, but it may be safety that historically you're not used to, like, you know, not really economic sensitive, the ability to shed jobs. Uh, you know, all of those things uh, kind of uh, you know, coming together in the perfect storm, so to speak. All right, guys, any uh, any other questions? No, none that I'm seeing right now. So I think uh, that should do it if you, uh, if you want to take us out. Sure, sure. I, I, thank you again for being here at our webinar. We love helping family and friends. And, and thank you for the referrals you sent us in 2022. Our firm continues to grow and you've been an integral part of that growth. So if you have a family friend member or family member that you'd like to uh, reach out to us with, we're glad to help, even if it's signing up or sending them webinar information for when those are going to occur or financial tax planning pieces that we send out. Uh, we're glad to have people and put them on their mailing list and, and, and share more about our organization 
and what we can do to help. So thank you again very much and have a wonderful evening.